Hello everyone, I hope you've had a delicious lunch. Uh, welcome to Social Machines 11. This is our last uh, session for the day before we're having the closing ceremony. We'll be in here for an hour and a half and we have two talks for you. The first is going to last about an hour, the second hopefully around half an hour. And uh, I'd like you to welcome to the stage Aaron talking about trends in article creation. Thank you very much and thanks for being here. Um, uh, so I will be talking about trends in article creation today, but before I get started, I, I need to thank my collaborators because they couldn't be at Wikimania. Um, Jody Schneider and Blue Magelli, uh, they help or they contributed to a substantial amount to the insights that I'm going to be talking to you about today. And I also need to thank uh, uh, Sony who contributed a whole bunch to my methods for data collection and the, the growth team, Matthew Flashin and Stephen Walling for making space for me to do this work on their team. Okay. So, uh, who am I? Um, I should tell you guys, maybe you were in the last session, I'm sorry, but I, I should go over this again. I'm a, my name is Aaron Hapaker, I'm a research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I do a lot of work around computing, technologies, and social systems. And so a lot of the work that I do at the foundation is understanding how the things that we're doing with technology have social effects. Um, I'm also a volunteer. A lot of my work as a volunteer is in developing tools for Wikipedians. I actually don't edit that much. I wish I had the time for it, but I really do like building tools. And so that's a lot of my work that I do as a volunteer. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you about four things. First, I'm going to give you some background into the article creation workflow. Uh, who here has created an article in Wikipedia? All right. Excellent. So this is going to be a review for most of you. I've given this presentation before and a lot of times people haven't gone over that. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I'll give you one set of results uh, where I dig, dug into uh, newcomer article creation across 10 wikis to try and get a sense for what scale it happens at and what sort of effects are going on over time. Then I'll tell you about the results of another study where we dig specifically into the, the process and, and performance of a, a article creation space for newcomers on Wikipedia called Articles for Creation. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll give you some insights that I think this research brings to how we can design technologies. We can use the science to design new technologies that have the effects that we're looking for. All right, so because I talk really fast, and there's going to be a lot of stuff here. I want to start with the end of my slides, which are the conclusion, and I'll come back to them later too. Uh, first, I'm going to argue to you today that anonymous editors should be able to create articles. This, they can't create articles in the English Wikipedia, and there's absolutely no good quantitative evidence why that should be the case. Um, also, that blocking pre-publication review, which is one of the things that exists in articles for creation, is expensive, and I think it's costing us too much. There's a lot of things that are in art for articles for creation that are incredibly valuable. This is a very minor critique of the whole system, but this is something that I'm going to tell you. Um, and that the article drafting space, whether it's articles for creation or the new draft name space on Wikipedia, is lacking some critical technological support that could really help this be much more productive for new editors. All right. There we go. On to the background. So how to create an article. This should be familiar to you guys. Um, so you go to Wikipedia. Um, you, you find a title that doesn't exist, which is an interesting way to go about it. Um, so in this case, I search for an article that doesn't exist. Luckily, that doesn't exist. Um, and so I can just click on this link at the top of the search results. It brings me to an empty search pane because I happen to be logged in. Um, and I can fill in some article content, like here's a header and some content for the first section. And once I think it's ready, I just hit save page and we're done. I just produced an article on English Wikipedia. It's that simple. Um, so this is a process that I, I'm going to refer to as direct to main or direct to main namespace. These are articles that are published right away in the first revision. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that happens on the English Wikipedia after an article makes it to the main namespace. And so um, you guys may be familiar with these acronyms, the new page patrol, uh, criteria for speed deletion, and articles for deletion. These are all processes of curation that are designed to bring scrutiny to articles that are put in the English Wikipedia to make sure that they're of encyclopedic relevance and of reasonable quality, don't contain material that shouldn't exist in the wiki, etc. Um, so, there we go. So if any one of these uh, processes comes to the conclusion, the article might be deleted. Um, so I'm just going to collapse this down for the rest of the talk. There's a lot of stuff that happens between an article going to the main namespace and, and it either surviving or being deleted. And anyway, I'll get back to that in just a moment. 
I want to talk about another workflow, uh, one that puts a draft in front of uh, sending an article directly to main namespace. And so user space drafts are a good example of this. Who here has created a user space draft before? Uh, a few fewer people. That, that actually lines up with my data. It's still the majority of people in the room. Um, so the way that a user space draft works is, so if you notice when I was talking about my volunteer work, my volunteer username is user epoch fail. If I want to create an article as a user space draft, I just add a slash after my username, type the article title that I want, and I follow generally the same pattern. But it doesn't go directly to the main namespace, and it doesn't incur the scrutiny. Um, I can iterate on it in my user space. I can make mistakes. I can, I can fail to assert its notability and the reasonableness of it. I can even put a whole bunch of content in there that should never belong in an encyclopedia, learn a little bit more, and realize that I should probably delete it on my own and fix my mistakes. And then I can move it to the main namespace when it's ready. Cool, right? So what I really want to get at is drafting is, you can think of it as sort of like this safe space to iterate and make mistakes, a safe uh, a space to avoid the scrutiny until you're ready for it, um, the scrutiny of these, these curation processes. Um, so the third workflow that I want to talk to you about is called Articles for Creation. This is a project that exists on the English Wikipedia. And uh, before I dig too much into how this works, I want to give you a little bit of a background on where this came from. So in 2005, uh, Brian Bibber posted to the, the technological village pump uh, saying that Jimmy had me disable creation of new pages by anonymous users on N Wikipedia as an experiment. This is one in a series of experiments on cutting vandalism without cutting too much into the ability of people to get things done. Um, and so within a month, there was the, the birth of this project in English Wikipedia called Articles for Creation. And this is how it described itself at the time. Um, the easiest way to create a new article is to create an account and then log in. Um, but if you prefer not to create an account, you can post requests here and somebody might create them. Um, so um, article creation existed in the state for about a year, um, but by February 2007, uh, there was a change. Um, and I'm actually pulling this off of the front page for the project. Um, th they changed the description of what articles for creation is to this page allows unregistered and new users create new articles with the assistance of experienced Wikipedians. And I want to highlight this articles for creation became a space for new users to work with experienced Wikipedians, presumably as mentors, to help them produce good articles. And so this is roughly what the articles for creation process looks like. I'm going to try and stand out of the way so that you, all, you can all see. You can create a draft. You submit it as a pending status. Pending means I'm submitting this for review. It goes through this, this process within the safe space of articles for creation where it can be accepted and declined, but decline doesn't mean deleted. Decline just means that it goes back to draft status and you can iterate it on again and submit it for review another time. So we're still in safe space land. Nothing, nothing really gets deleted in articles for creation unless it's incredibly problematic or it's been sitting idle for a long time. Um, and so presumably during this time in Articles for Creation, you can get some mentorship. And so you can, you can try things, make mistakes, have other people help you understand how to fix them, and then fix them yourself. And so you would imagine this would have some advantages over just starting in your user space where there aren't mentors that are coming in to help you work on things. Um, and so like I said, the scrutiny comes afterwards, and so you get to avoid it you know, until you're ready, until Articles for Creation thinks that you're ready. Um, so there are these three workflows, direct to main, user space draft, which is a safe space, and articles for creation, which has formalized mentorship. Okay, on to the actual first study that I ran on top of this stuff. So there were three questions that I really wanted to address to get a sense for how article creation worked in Wikipedia. So I wanted to know who is creating articles and what sort of characteristics do these users have? Um, whose articles survive the scrutiny of other editors? And what effect does the workflow have on uh, whose articles survive and how many articles are created? So on to methods. So first, survived, surviving had to be formalized because presumably an article could be deleted at any time in its, in its timeline. An article could take years and years to be deleted or it could be deleted within minutes. Um, so I'm sorry this graph is a little bit small, but it should become clear once I start explaining. So on the bottom axis here, that's time. On the y-axis, it's the probability that an article that will eventually be deleted is deleted at this particular time. And sadly, you can't see these labels here, but I want to show that the, the majority of these mounds in probability, when articles are usually deleted, is between a minute and an hour after creation. 
And this tail extends out until about a week before it really collapses, and there's just not much deletion happening after that point. Um, so when I say surviving articles for the rest of this talk, I drew a cutoff at a month. If an article survived for a month in the main namespace before being deleted, then I call it a surviving article. And I assume that if it was deleted, it was deleted for other reasons than it was low quality. It obviously made it through the initial quality barriers um, because those are usually kicking in between a minute, an hour, and up to a day or a week. Um, and so on to editor classes. And so this, when I'm asking who creates articles, these are the classes that I'm looking at. Um, so I was looking at users based on their tenure and how they got to the wiki. And when I say tenure, I just mean time since registration. So I looked at new users between registration and a day of experience. So these are users who created an article within a day of registering their account. Um, I also broke it down for between a day and a week, a week to a month, and greater than a month, with the assumption that users who have been editing Wikipedia for greater than a month have probably learned a few things that are gonna have some different characteristics in creating articles and different survival rates. Um, I also looked at anonymous editors for non-English Wikipedias where, where they can create articles. And I looked at this weird class of new users that, are, that I refer to as auto-created. And auto-created is this weird weird thing that happens since we started to have central auth in Wikipedia and your user account would actually follow you between language wikis. So to explain what this means, uh, let's say that I sign up on English Wikipedia as a new user. This is actually true. That was the first wiki that I signed up for. And the next wiki that I went to was German Wikipedia because I was reading a research paper about it and I wanted to go check it out. I actually did this before Central Auth existed, but let's say that I did it after Central Auth existed. I would be a new user on English Wikipedia, but my account on German Wikipedia would be auto-created for me when I just logged into the page. And this is saved in the database, and there's a timestamp for when I did that and all that sort of stuff. But the crucial thing that I want to talk to you about is I wasn't really a new editor on German Wikipedia. I knew something about Wikipedia before I got there. And so the same thing happened when I went to Commons Next. So I want to get this point that auto-created means that you were a new user somewhere else, and you just happened to show up on this wiki recently. Okay. So the workflow is examined. Um, I already talked to you about these three different workflows, the direct domain, user space, and articles for creation. I just want to show you where I was able to perform these analyses. So at the foundation, at the time that I performed this analysis, we had specific analytics databases for English and German Wikipedia, but we didn't have it for the rest of the wikis that I wanted to look at. And because of that, I couldn't track moving of pages in those other wikis in a reasonable way. So I could really only look at direct domain articles in, in all the wikis that were in English and German. So because I could look at page moves in English and German, I could look at it, the user space draft workflow. And of course, uh, as far as I know anyway, Articles for Creation is an English Wikipedia only project. So that was the only wiki that I could take a look at it in. Okay. Oh, and I forgot, I should mention that these, these wikis are the top 10 by the number of articles as listed on the MediaWiki.org site. Okay, so first question, who's creating all the articles? So I'm, I'm breaking out just two of the wikis here. We're going to get to a big graph later, but I want to talk about some parts of this first. So I just took English and German Wikipedia, and just because they were on the left side of my huge graph. Um, so um, when we look at who's creating the articles in these two wikis, you can see that users with a lot of experience are the ones who are primarily creating articles. This is that month dash bucket. Um, and so they're creating uh, about 80%, a little bit more of the articles. Um, and in uh, English Wikipedia, I want to point to that less than a day of experience because that's, that's, uh, that's the next biggest bucket in English Wikipedia. And so they're, they're second. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of new editors who just registered accounts are creating articles. But it's, it's a lot lower in German Wikipedia, and we see this much larger bump for anonymous editors creating articles in German Wikipedia. So, oh, and I had highlights. <laughs> so now that here's, here's the whole graph that I just cut off the side. Um, so I, I want to point out that they all have generally the same pattern, that where anonymous editors can, can create articles, they're creating article, more articles per month than newly registered users are. It's only in English Wikipedia where that, that bar reaches higher. Um, and you can tell, too, that where anonymous users create articles, they're, they're taking a lot of that work from experienced editors. They're just creating, they're, they're, that proportion dies down for, for um, experienced editors. So they're creating them at a pretty massive scale. Um, so there's one thing that I want to point out here with Italian Wikipedia. Uh, this is going to be a running theme in me studying wikis that speak languages that I don't understand. 
Um, a lot of anonymous editors create articles in Italian Wikipedia. They almost caught up to the experienced registered editors, and I have no idea why that's the case. And so, so this is the first time that I'm going to do this, which is, whoops, uh, it, invite uh, Italian Wikipedians from the audience to to maybe raise questions at the end of this, or or if if you can't get a question in, come talk to me afterwards and help me understand what the heck is going on there. Um, and I also wanted to point out Chinese Wikipedia, where there is there is almost no anonymous editors creating articles at all. It's almost all experienced registered editors. And again, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Those two are kind of the outliers. So. Um, to go back to my question, who's creating all the articles? Well, it's mostly experienced Wikipedians. On the lower bound, it was 55% in Italian Wikipedia, and on the upper bound, it's 85% in English Wikipedia. Um, the second class is anons, and of course, as, as I said, that's not true in English Wikipedia. They're not creating articles. And, and it's about 5 to 15% newcomers, depending on the wiki that you look at. And so it's mostly experienced editors. There's a lot of anons, and, and newcomers are a pretty close class. Um, and the newest of newcomers by that. So the next question that I want to talk about is whose articles survive. Um, so again, I'm pulling out English and German Wikipedia. Um, the y-axis here is the, the proportion of articles that are created that survive for that month-long period. Um, and so we can see a couple patterns that, that jump out immediately when we look at this. The first is that when I look at registered users by the amount of time since they registered their account, we see the exact effect that we'd expect that if you create an article in your first day of editing Wikipedia, you have a pretty low likelihood of that article surviving the scrutiny of other editors. Um, but as you gain more experience, the probability that your article is going to be kept increases. Um, OK, there's another thing. Which is, this, and, and I promise you, this was very surprising to me. I thought that this would go the other direction. It looks like where anonymous editors can create articles in German Wikipedia, their articles are more likely to survive than the newest of newcomers who are creating this massive amount of articles. So now I want to jump back to, uh, so this, this is a topic that's been brought up in English Wikipedia a lot of times. There's been RFCs to turn on anonymous article creation again. And so I just pulled out some RFC comments um, uh, that are against this maneuver. And so um, here's one. Uh, sticking your finger into an electric shredder is not a sensible experiment. We know exactly what the result will be. And confirming the prediction of turning on anonymous editing, again, will be painful. And, and do you think the deletion backlogs are bad now? Just wait until IP creation is open. It's like opening a big can of worms. But it doesn't look like that. Um, and this is true for almost all the wikis that I looked at. Um, I'm going to pull out a couple of examples here, but I just want to note, like each one of the wikis that I highlighted here, the survival rate of anonymous editor-created articles is dramatically higher. It's more than twice as high in all of the wikis where anonymous editors can create articles. Now, there's one notable exception, uh, Polish Wikipedia. This is another WAF. I don't know what's going on here. Polish Wikipedians, please come talk to me. Uh, I would really like to understand this. Um, and also Japanese Wikipedia. Japanese Wikipedia, everybody's articles survive. Um, and I'm not really sure what's going on there. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so to recap quick what I was saying in the graphs. So more experience seems to lead to more survival. And this sort of makes sense, that as you get experience editing Wikipedia, you can know what sort of articles are reasonable. You can get a better sense for what belongs in an article when you need to argue for notability and that sort of stuff. Um, that Anon seem to be better than the newest of newcomers. That it, it seems like we should probably be letting them create articles. They would create a ton of articles that would be less of a burden on the people who are managing these backlogs. And, and apparently all Japanese editors create articles that survive. Okay, third question. What effect does the workflow have on this? And so like I was saying earlier, I can only look at English and German Wikipedia, and for the articles for creation, I can only look at English. Okay, so let's look at German Wikipedia first. So this graph is a little bit crazy. Let me explain what's going on here. I like to look at trends over time. And that's the, the x-axis here. Because I think that looking tre at trends over time and correlating it to what's happening in the wiki right now can really give us insights into why we are where we are. And so that's why I really wanted to pull it out here and show you what this, this sort of trend looks like. So 
you can see there's these original namespaces. Zero corresponds to direct domain article creations. And uh, user drafts start in namespace two. And so these are, these are highlighted with different colors, the lines that, that correspond to the survival proportion of these articles. And so there, there's a couple things that I want to point out here that will make these trends clear. So first, if you're a new editor and you have less than a day of experience and you start your article as a user draft in German Wikipedia, it has a much higher likelihood of surviving. And that's been relatively true over the entire period that I could perform my analysis, which was 2008 through 2014. Logging tables done before 2008. Um, so, but if you have more than a day of experience and you start your article creation in user draft space, then you actually have a lower likelihood of your article surviving. And you know this is this is a good example of why it's good to look at trends over time. Because if I would have just looked at, at one time slice, we might have all sorts of questions about what the heck is going on in that one time slice. But we can see here that basically that trend was uniform over time. That that uh, if you just go directly to main, your articles are more likely to survive. And so I bet you there's some propensity going on here. That for experienced editors, maybe drafts are reserved for the articles that might not make it, that you're not quite sure about, that you want to work on first before you push it to the main namespace. But again, I'm not quite sure. Three question marks means please come talk to me if you have any ideas. OK, so on to the English Wikipedia. So now we have the full three workflows here. So we have direct domain, we have user draft, and an AFC draft. And so again, I want to point out some trends here. I'm sorry, the colors kind of jump around, and that's R. I should have just fixed that. Um, anyway, so if you go, uh, if you do any either type of draft, especially after 2010, I'm not sure what was going on with user drafts for for uh, young editors, uh, new editors um, before 2010. But it seems that it's it's perfectly clear that if you draft, then you're going to have a high level of acceptance in the English Wikipedia. You know, and specifically. Um, Articles that are created through AFC's process are more likely to survive. They just sort of live around the 95% level, even though there's, there's a little bit of fluctuation month to month. Um, and except for the most experienced editors, we again see this trend where articles that are created in user draft is consistently less likely to survive than articles that are created in main namespace. However, articles that are created through the AFC process by experienced editors, they still tend to survive slightly more than the ones that were created directly in the main namespace. Um, there's this dip in, in week to a month here. And I just want to point out, that's, that's an anomaly. We, we don't have a lot of observations there. This is, this is the proportion of article creations again. I just want to show you, like, that, that bar is super duper tiny. And that was for articles for creation. A very tiny proportion of articles actually get created through articles for creation, especially for experienced editors. Um, so that dip is just an anomaly. You don't need to worry about that. Um, OK. So, so we have this, this pattern that for most, most new editors, at least, that uh, creating an article in direct domain is less likely to survive than creating it in user space, and it's less likely to survive than creating it through the articles for creation process. Um, so the articles for creation process wasn't always around. And you remember that I pointed out that, that there were, it went through some stages. It was first just for anonymous editors to request articles for creation. Then it was for new users to create articles. Well, there was this event that happened uh, in the middle of 2011 where there was a change to the article creation wizard um, and uh, that directed people to create pages in articles for creation if they were going through the wizard. And strangely enough, we see this temporal correlation where if I look at the expected number of surviving article creations per new editor, we see this drop where the number of surviving, presumably high quality articles in English Wikipedia that new editors create falls about 50% right when AFC picks up. So I'm going to come back to this. But first, let me recap again. So what effect does the workflow have? Um, drafts seem to help articles survive, especially for new editors. That's what that star is supposed to mean. I don't know why I lost that. Um, oh, there we go. Um, German is weird, and I don't quite know what's going on, so please talk to me. Um, AFC seem, it like, looks like it might be trading productivity for quality. Remember, I was saying that 95% of articles survive when they come out of articles for creation. But we see this dip, and I don't quite know why. Yes, the higher survival rate and the lower production, a 50% loss of, of uh, productivity for newcomers. Um, so now I want to ask, but why? Shouldn't working with mentors produce more surviving articles? On to the second study. So this is an important point that I want to make in how science works, 
is that we dig into something, we find out what it is that we don't know, and then we dig in again. And it produces this conversation, and I don't usually get to do this in a talk, but I'm showing you two studies where we ran a study, we thought we learned something, found something very weird, and wanted to know what was going on, and then dug into it again. Okay, so we have this workflow that, um, where newcomers are suddenly sent to articles for creation halfway through 2011, and then this leads to lower productivity. And so I just wanna show you what this looks like in the, the article wizard. So there's this, um, when you get to the end of the article wizard and you've answered all the questions like, yes, this is notable, yes, I have sources, yes, this should be an encyclopedia, that sort of stuff, you get these two options. On the top is to go to articles for creation, on the bottom is to go direct to the main namespace, and, and there's this note in there that I pulled out here, which is, we strongly recommend that you use articles for creation. This is how the, the, the uh, section for going direct to main is prefixed. So you're, you're sort of cautioned against going direct to the main namespace. Um, and, and then we see this dip that sort of corresponds to this change where, where newcomers are all of a sudden creating our, all of their articles in, in AFC. So why did this happen? What's breaking down here? Or is something even breaking down? So I had two hypotheses that I really wanted to chase for this. One was AFC's process is too slow, that it's heavyweight, you have to perform reviews, somebody actually has to show up to say this article is acceptable and we're gonna move it to main namespace or this article is not. And maybe maybe they're just drafts that are just languishing in articles for creation, there's just not enough people to do that sort of stuff. So I wanted to know how long these drafts are actually sitting around. My second hypothesis is a little bit more nuanced that AFC drafts are hidden from pot potential collaborators. Um, I didn't show this. In fact, I should have had a slide for this. But at the time that I ran the study, the way that you created drafts and articles for creation is you created on a Wikipedia talk page because anonymous editors can create talk pages, but they can create no non-talk pages. And so the hack that they, made, they did so that anonymous editors could create AFC drafts was they made it a talk page. And by making the actual article draft the talk page, that means that you can't have a talk page. And also, it doesn't show up when you search, or it'll never show up when you click on links. If you clicked on a red link that was actually relevant to the draft, it would not bring you there. So let me talk to you for a second about Linus's Law. Who, who has heard of Linus's Law? All right, so we've got a few people, so this is good that I spend some time on this. So Linus's Law is about open source software engineering. Um, the idea is that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. That given enough people who see an incomplete, or this is, this is applying it to Wikipedia, that given enough people who see an incomplete article, all potential contributions to that article will be easy for somebody. Like somebody will be the subject matter expert that says, I know what belongs in this section, or I know how to format this correctly, or something like that. And by having these articles be visible, you're basically inviting collaborators, and it's going to be easy work for them. Whereas if you just had one person writing the article, they might get to subject areas where they're less expert, and they have to do a ton of reading, and that's a lot more work. This corresponds very closely to software engineering, where some people are better at solving some bugs than others. Um, so the, the insight of this is that visibility is critical to open collaboration processes. So on the methods again. So I used AFC templates to track these status changes of going from draft status to pending to, to accepted and declined. All AFC pages have this AFC submission template on them, and I can pull out this first parameter to, to get at what stage an article is in at, a, at any particular time. And so when that, that parameter is T, it's draft, I have no idea why, we don't need to talk about that, I just accept it. Um, when you delete it, it's pending. Um, when, you, when you set it to A, it's accepted, and when you set it to D, it's deleted. And so what I could do is I could process the history of these articles that went through articles for creation and find out when they move through different parts of the process and when reviews happen. So I use the MySQL database. This is available in LabsDB, so you could go and replicate my study. Actually, I have my code online, so I'll point you to that later. Um, and I, I parse these templates using a combination of the uh, XML dumps, and I, I specifically asked for special permission just for the case of the study so that I could gather deleted pages from the API and so I could see when they changed their status too. So this analysis all includes pages that have been deleted. Um, and I also spent a lot of time, and this is actually most of my collaborators spending this time, but we had lots of discussions reading through draft histories and discussions to try and get a sense for how people experience AFC, what sort of things were going on in AFC, and, and what sort of frustrations people were having. Okay, results. One hypothesis at a time. First hypothesis, AFC's process is too slow. Um, 
So I specifically wanted to look at this uh, pending to accepted or declined status because this is the user who created the draft is saying, I'm ready for review. I want to know how long does it take to actually get a review. And so we're looking at another one of these density plots here where I have time on the x-axis and the probability of something happening, in this case the review, on the y-axis. And we can see that most of the density, you're probably going to get a review within the hour. And, and if you don't get it within the hour, there's another peak that's between a day and a week. So you, here's my hypothesis about what's going on here, which is that if you, if you submit a draft for review, if somebody's around and they're usually around, then you're going to get it reviewed really fast. And if, if they're not around for review, it might take a week for somebody to come in, maybe next weekend, maybe the day of the week that somebody goes in to do reviews, but it's probably going to get done there. And it's very, very unlikely that it's going to take more than a month, which is the last tick on the right hand side there. So, 66.5% of reviews happen within 24 hours. This is, this is pretty fast. It's about as fast as you could expect an asynchronous system to work. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to ask is maybe there's a process breakdown and newcomers are just taking forever to submit their drafts to review and so they're languishing to wait to be submitted. Um, so same sort of pattern here where the majority of submissions actually happen within a minute. So within a minute of when the, the user saves their first revision to the article, they'll save another revision that submits it to AFC. And there's, there's a few that actually make it out to a day, a week, a month, and a year. Um, but it's, it's not really the majority of the set. So 93% of reviewed drafts are, are submitted for review within a week of creation. Um, so this is pretty reasonable. Spend a week drafting your article and then submit it for review, right? Um, but when I was looking, I found that 29% of drafts were never submitted for review. So let me go back to the question, or the, the hypothesis. AFC's process is too slow? No. Nah. No, it's, it actually does okay. They have a backlog, but they have backlog drives. They do a pretty good job about this. You know, these backlog drives seem to keep review time short. But there might be a process breakdown where drafts aren't submitted for review. It could be that newcomers just don't understand the whole template system for submitting for review. I'm not quite sure. But let's move on to the second hypothesis that drafts aren't getting collaborators, that Linus's law is being violated here, and so we're not benefiting from the open collaboration process. So for this, I split the time in the world into pre-AFC, pre-AFC on this, this um, uh, uh, article creation wizard, and post when AFC was recommended via the article creation wizard. And so before it was recommended on the article creation wizard, about 3% of newcomer drafts went to AFC, whereas afterwards, about 30% of newcomer drafts went to AFC. And um, I looked at collaboration patterns as activity by not the creating user. So I was looking for other people coming to that draft and working on it with them. Um, and working on, I'll, I'll make a comparison with direct domain articles in just a moment. So I was looking at revisions by, by other editors, the amount of bytes added to the article by other editors, uh, unique registered editors, and the unique anonymous editors. I think anonymous are really interesting because when you're thinking about the many eyes principle, there's a lot of anonymous editors and they might at least be able to do some cleanup. Um, and so what I did was I looked at from the time of draft creation or the time of article creation, I looked at the first four weeks to see how um, the rates of contributions by people played out because I wanted to know over time how does collaboration in these different spaces change. And so just to make it clear to, to those of you who like structure to this sort of stuff in the audience, I'm assuming a natural experiment here, but I want to look at both very carefully to, to make sure that I understand what's going on. So I'm going to measure AFC drafts and main namespace drafts in both before and after. Um, so this is a complicated graph, so I want to walk you through it. So uh, on the right hand side here, I have this legend for pre-AFC. That's the dashed lines that are on the graph, and that corresponds to the pre-AFC time period. And post-AFC, of course, that's the solid lines in the graph, and that corresponds to the post-AFC time period. Um, I also have articles that are created as AFC drafts, those are red, and articles that are created as direct main, those are blue. And on the, the y-axis of this graph, I have my collaboration measured. On the x-axis, I have time. And so we get to see how the difference in collaboration activities changes over time. And so to hop back just a second, we can see this trend where if you go to AFC, it looks like at least for the second, third, and fourth week, it's clear you're going to getting less revisions from other editors on your draft. Whereas if you go to direct domain, you're going to get more. But I want to zoom in quick to that upper left side so that we can explore those couple data points a little bit more clearly. So if I look at the difference between the pre and post AFC periods, um, 
in the post-AFC period, the solid lines, the ones that I have circled here, there's a big difference. So after AFC went live, if you went to directly to the main namespace, you would get way more collaboration, significantly more collaboration than if you went to articles for creation drafts. But before AFC was recommended to newcomers in the article wizard, it, it was about the same. Those error bars are overlapping. So um, that's just one of the metrics. I want to, oh, darn it, this screen is so small. I wish I could zoom in on this. but. Oh good, I actually highlighted them, so it's going to do most of the work for me. So when I look at the number of unique editors working on the article, I see a similar pattern. So this is unique other registered editors who are collaborating with the, the draft creator on the article. Um, and for all four weeks, you're going to see less collaboration from other people, less edits from other registered editors on your draft than if you went directly to the main namespace. And it's the same story if I look at anonymous editors, but maybe even more so. We can really see the gap between uh, the blue lines and the red lines in that case. Oh, there we go, highlighting again. So back to the, back to the hypothesis that Linus's law is being violated here. It, it looks like it's supported. AFC drafts see less collaboration than direct main namespace created articles. And the qualitative work suggests that the onus is on the creator alone to make productive changes to the article. That usually what you get from somebody who's mentoring or reviewing you in AFC is suggestions on what, we, what you might do to the article when they're reviewing it as declined or accepted or whatever. Um, so they leave it up to the creating the draft creator to actually make these changes. Um, so in summary, uh, the hypothesis that AFC's review process is too slow, that's unsupported, but we see this process breakdown, and I, I think it might be because the template process for submitting for review, it might just be too hard, it might just be a lot to ask of new editors. And we definitely see less collaboration, that, that there's just less activity in these articles, and it, it makes sense because you can't find them. If you, if you create a direct domain article from a red link, you're going to have a ton of people that are now browsing to that article, that new draft or new direct domain namespace article, because it's visible and it's open to the rest of the wiki. So now onto part four, which is how I think that the science and theory that we're building about what sort of patterns are happening can lead to changes in what we do with technology. So first of all, anonymous seem to be better than we thought. Um, so maybe it's time to revisit article creation again uh, for anonymous editors. Um, in the draft namespace on English Wikipedia, anonymous editors can create articles, but they can't publish. And that might be okay. I haven't been able to rerun this analysis after the draft namespace was put in place. Um, either way, we need to understand anonymous editors better. Our intuitions here seem to be failing us. This is not sticking your hand in a blender. There's something else going on here. Anons are not equal to vandals, and they're clearly having a higher survival rate for their newly created articles than the newest of newbies who we do like create articles. All right, and now AFC seems to trade productivity for quality. Um, and I, I think that there's some insights that we can get from this English Wikipedia essay. It's probably the most cited essay. It may as well be a guideline, which is called the Bold Revert Discuss Cycle. And I won't bore you with the details. The, generally, the idea is that you should boldly do what you want to do um, because it's probably right. If somebody disagrees, they'll revert you or undo what it is that you did, and then you should have a discussion about it. Because most of the time, you did the thing that, that, that was actually right, that if you let people do what they want, they tend to do the right thing, and then you don't have to have process around them doing the right thing. That maybe we can have less process if we only address them when they've done the wrong thing. Um, so. So this insight of bold revert discuss that most people will do the right thing if you let them, I think that this is a strong, a strong argument for not having a pre-publication review process. That, that I think that mentorship is good. I think a lot of the things that are going on in AFC are really, really good, but having a threshold that people have to wait for, that people have to engage in, it, it, it might be the wrong way to approach this. And, and for workflow designers and developers um, that, that might be working on tool apps or even at the foundation, that I argue that this is the technological support we need. That if we're going to have people creating articles as drafts in the draft namespace, we need visibility. And we ought to not block publication. We ought to not make people wait because they're going to do good work. Thank you.
you speak of experienced settlers and anonymous settlers as two complete different categories, <laughs> but they are. Yeah. You've got people who keep editing as anonymous editors, and you've got people who have usernames, but for some reason they forgot to log in, or they can't be bothered to log in, and so on. So it's, it would have been very surprising mm -hmm. if new users would have had um, a higher amount of kept articles. Mm -hmm. And have you looked at this? Have you, what's your thought on this? So one of the one of the difficulties that we have, so I, I really appreciate that you brought this up because I think you're absolutely right. All of the analysis that I've ever done of the behavior of anonymous editors seems to suggest this direction, that the stepping stone hypothesis of anonymous editing is just something that you do before you register. Uh, it doesn't seem to really hold. Uh, anonymous editors are doing a lot of, like qualitative, they, they seem to be doing the kind of behavior that new users, newly registered users, don't tend to do. Um, in the, the previous presentation that Stephen gave about our work with anonymous editors, he, he presented one of our results that if you are not edited anonymously right before you register, then you're more likely to do productive work when you register. I don't think that's because uh, editing anonymously beforehand is an important stepping stone. I think that's because that's evidence that you've been working for an anonymous editor for a while before you decided to get an account. And I think it's it's clear in some of the analyses that we're doing um, where we're actually tracking anonymous editors beyond the IP address. We're very careful about this. I could go on. I could give a completely separate presentation about dealing with the ethical concerns about tracking people between being logged in and logged out. Um, but there we see that it's about four percent of our active editors on English Wikipedia are anonymous, and so they're doing they're doing five edits or more a month to articles in English Wikipedia. And so I think it's a substantial portion of our population, and they might just not want a social identity, they, but they do want to stick around and do good work while they're here. So the slides where you um, presented the sort of before and after with the um, yeah. paired lines, can you tell us sort of what sort of scales on the y-axis there? Oh yeah, that's curious. that's a really good question. I was so, curious, like how many, how many so, collaborators ah, this graph is a problem. You can actually see like the one data point. Hang on, R. I'm sorry. This is so. So I, I was. I was right. Okay. So uh, the the scale of this this y-axis. I use the geometric mean number of revisions. Uh, per per draft and uh, an article in this case, and I did that because the number of edits that an article gets tends to be logarithmically distributed. And this geometric mean, you can think about it as regular average for logarithmically distributed stuff. And so the error bars that you're seeing are geometric standard error bars around that. And so so what we're looking at here is um, oh, and it, it's important to note that I re-extrapolated this stuff. So it's not it's not actually logarithmic values that are over here. And so let me let me just point to these values that you can't read, and I'll, I'll tell you what this is. So that says 0.1, and so uh, what that's saying is that um, that uh, you have basically a 0.1 chance of getting an edit at, at this time, at, if at this line right here. Um, and so that's a pretty low chance. A lot of drafts just don't get edited. Um, but these lines are pulled up. In fact, I think we'd actually see them pulled much further apart if I didn't use this geometric mean because that's the sort of scaling that this deals with. And so we're not actually looking at that many edits. We're looking at like one or two drive-by edits, whereas a very, very few of these drafts and articles get hundreds of edits in their first few weeks. And so this is very small, and a lot of these are zeros. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Excellent. So I think there, yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, a comment. I, I heard to me that uh, you, when you were looking at some of the anomalous readings of some of the other languages of Wikipedia, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you had already taken some of these cultural and other factors into account. You know, for instance, with the Japanese Wikipedia and the higher rate of article creation and retention for anonymous editors, I believe that's because a great deal of the Japanese, you know, a much larger percentage of the Japanese editor population following Japanese internet culture and, you know, remains anonymous and do not open accounts. Uh, and as for the Chinese Wikipedia, again, you know, I don't speak to the Japanese or Chinese, like, but if other editors who are here and work on those wikis do want to speak mm -hmm. to this, that's, you know, very helpful. But with the Chinese Wikipedia, <coughs> we have to factor into, a, into account as far as anonymous entity goes, the effects of the Great Firewall and Golden Shield on mainland China and having some experience with from the People's Republic of China to tell you it's anybody, you know, it would not be worth your time to try to get around it with a VPN if you just if you didn't want to also open an account. Yeah. And I think that depresses the, you know, 
create an anonymous or creation from in uh, Chinese the gates all the mm-hmm. world. Yeah, that's so. I, I I should have brought up. I actually I, I heard that thing about Japanese Wikipedia before that there's a lot of pop culture on there, and I think that that's actually an interesting insight that some some wiki is welcome a broader range of contributions. I'd really love to talk to somebody who's a Japanese Wikipedia editor about how that's going for the wiki. Um, so thank you for that comment. That's that's really great. So the so the I, I believe the question was that that maybe if the article already exists in English Wikipedia it can be translated or at least you know pulled the content the, the relevance of the topic can be argued uh, in a in another language and so that might that might raise um, survival rates are you are you thinking particularly for anonymous editors? Um, I was thinking all mm-hmm. all Yeah. So I, I think that's a really interesting hypothesis. Um, uh, it's it's definitely something that, that we, we, we didn't really dig into, but it, it seems likely. The, the reason that I might not think that that's, that's playing out that much in the data is that we see generally the same sort of level of survival rates across wikis. There were only a couple examples that I had pulled out where it was really strange, but I actually think that that would be a really interesting way to, to examine cross wiki behavior, and I know that there are some people in this room who might be excited about that. Thank you. Yeah, you're you're okay. I'm just letting them know they're next. <laughs> well, um, uh, you, you, you get the experience, you, you define the experience uh, as, as, as more than a month old. Yes. Uh, um, and you said that that some of those were using the article for creation projects. Yeah, yeah. And at what point do, do you know at what point has someone stopped using the article for creation projects? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I have that. I have the data necessary to answer that question, but I did not look into that. So that's that's something that we could definitely do in a follow-up analysis. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a, a good question. I mean, we, we could have had an arbitrary number of buckets here, and and I, I just I, I settled on um, uh, the the day, week, month uh, cutoffs. Um, because I, I've done a lot of work on the, the survival of newcomers, the rate at which they're, they're, they're reverted changes over time, and that seemed to be where all of the change happened. So there's like a lot of change, and it's mostly because a lot of newcomers just don't stick around for a month. You're a different kind of person if you stick around and keep editing for a month. Um, but I, I mean, that's definitely something to look into. I don't think that there would be that much signal there, but honestly, it was pretty arbitrary what I what I chose for this cutoff. I, I didn't dig out further into that. It seemed like we got a lot of signal here and got a lot of understanding from the cutoffs that I chose. We could definitely do that. Um, so in the, the back there, I think Gerard. Um, you made a comment about the, uh, for the experienced editors, the drafts, the, ed- the first drafted articles actually being, having a lower rate of being kept than the uh, directing new namespace, uh, main na- namespace edits. <coughs> Um, I think one, uh, one thing which could explain this is that especially the people who already had the experience of having articles deleted will say, okay, I make a draft first so it's better when it comes. But of course, whatever the reason is, their previous edits got del- articles got deleted. So, My so, yeah. Exist. So if, it, if you guys didn't hear that, the idea was that, that maybe, maybe user space drafts are created after a, 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 an attempt to go direct to main already failed. And so that, I, I think that's a really interesting hypothesis. It seems reasonable, and my, the way that I measured this was on a per article basis, not on a per user basis. Because of course, like a user could create articles through different workflows, but it, it seems like that would be a good way to, to dig into this. That if we could have a sense for what is the same article, you know, just being created again, or if we could have a sense for the workflows that a user generally goes through, we, we could dig into that and find out. I think that's a really keen insight, and thank you. Um, there was another question that was up there. Yes, as an extension to your research, uh, do you envisage 
analyzing the patterns of articles rejected. So pattern of topic, field, discipline. Is it political science, human rights, and things like that? So I, I wish that my, my collaborator, uh, Blue Magelli, was here because she's dug into this before, modeling of the types of articles that tend to be deleted. And I'm sorry to say that I, I don't think that I can, I can speak to it. I know that, the, that she's published some literature and that there's, there's more coming out. Um, if, you, if you catch me afterwards, we, we can go together and we can go take a look at that study real quick. So there's a, there's a study that Mr. Zeman did in the English Wikipedia where he, he dug specifically into this question. And so of course it's a correlation analysis, so it's hard, it's hard to argue causation from it. And I mean, really, that's, that's sort of what I'm showing you here. Even a natural experiment is a correlation analysis. Um, but what he found was that there was, there was a high prediction rate that, that um, if a newcomer creates an article and that article is deleted, then they're not likely to stick around. Um, in my own work, where I, I, I conflated being reverted with being deleted in, in models that, that predict newcomer retention and control for a whole bunch of other effects, um, such as uh, the amount of edits that they do in their first edit session after they register their account, that's hugely predictive of retention. When I include that in a model with the, the rate at which things are deleted, it helps me deal with the propensity, like what type of users create articles and that sort of stuff. Anyway having your article deleted was a really strong effect. So I confirmed those results. It looks like there's something going on here where like a drafting namespace strategy, uh, a space where you can get mentorship and avoid scrutiny until you're ready for it might be a really good idea. Now, we didn't dig into um, whether these were desirable newcomers who were having their article deleted and then leaving. I, I think that that's, that's a really cool place to dig into and a really cool place to build technologies for. Um, so I think it was there and then there. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, something like uh, flooded reviews. It's uh, checking reviews or something like this. This is a tool which was turned on on a couple of wikis. So we mark edits as a, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, reviewed edits. It has the name of the system. So uh, in our case, when uh, anonymous user edits and create articles, Usually after this comes some user with more experience. So like person who have more than 500 edits, that's the system settings. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is the reason that why it's in this way. That we always should, in the idea world, the person should fix the broken mm -hmm. article. But in this case, when he should come and check it, Probably that's the reason that why it's so broken on Polish Wikipedia. You know, this is, I, I think this is a really good point. So the idea is that there's, there's a system on, on Polish Wikipedia that, that encourages a review of every single anonymous edit. Is that right? Yeah. And so an anonymous article creation is an anonymous edit. And so it might just be that the review is incredibly effective on Polish Wikipedia, and so that's why the survival rate is lower. So there, there's a couple reasons why I would suspect that that's not the case. So English Wikipedia has a page creation tool. It has it has robust processes around around articles article creation, and um, we actually see uh, you know lower survival rates um, for articles and more reverts, um, higher revert rates in English Wikipedia. And that would suggest that that's more restrictive. Of course, we don't have a nonce for English Wikipedia. I, I you know, but this is like comparing wikis. This is this is one of the things that can play out in it. So it could just be that no wikis except for, for English and Polish Wikipedia actually check anonymous article page creations. Um, I, I'm skeptical of that, but that's, I, like I said, that's, that's the problem with this analysis. You can't just perform this comparison and know for sure, and it might be worth digging into that to make sure that my assertions about anons are accurate. Um, we, we do see it play out in the quality of edits generally on English Wikipedia, though. Um, there. <laughs> Does the foundation have any plans to produce a wizard which actually helps people create articles? 
Um, so that's that's a really good question. I'm, I'm looking at uh, Stephen Walling here, who's the product manager of the growth team. This is something that we dug into a little bit. Yeah, Stephen, if you want to make your way down here, that'd be cool. Um, I'll just talk until you get here. Um, so anyway, uh, the, the big reason why I started this analysis in the first place and started digging into this um, was because we were looking at the potential for doing substantial technology support for the draft namespace on English Wikipedia and then moving it to other wikis. And so I'll let him talk about the, the ideas that we were looking at and the potential, potential for going back to that. Yeah, so, so, uh, so, so what happened around the time of this study and, and shortly afterwards is, um, is the, the draft, like the bare bones draft namespace um, to sort of help articles for creation project um, move out of using talk pages was launched on English Wikipedia, but that's really, really bare bones. The only things that it does is just let you use a regular page that's prepended with draft, um, and you have to know how to create pages and it doesn't give you a lot of help. And then it, it no indexes those articles so that search engines can't find them. Um, and that's been pretty good, though it's been it's been pretty small. Um, even though it, articles for creation target has uh, switched over to use it entirely. And in the meantime, what we did was start usability testing prototypes of things like a self-publishing tool and review tools and stuff like that for drafts. Um, but ultimately, we didn't go to the phase yet of actually building those products because um, when we looked at like the, 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 the team's goal is to, to grow the like new active editor community. And we looked at the number of people whose first edits are creating articles versus the number of people who edit existing articles. Like we still have a ton of stuff to try. Um, so the, the data just sort of drove us to pri reprioritize and look at um, asking anonymous editors to register and um, providing like tools for people who want to edit existing articles. So the answer is, it's still on our roadmap. Um, it's in the plans for the next year. Um, exactly when that happens depends on other test results and what we do and how it goes. Um, if you're interested, look up draft namespace on MediaWiki.org and you can actually try out those prototypes and watch the usability tests and give us feedback. I think it'd be really interesting, especially if you're already a part of like, say the articles for creation process or you work in New Page Patrol on a non-English Wikipedia because um, it give you a feel for the kind of like the attitudes and, and confusion that new editors experience. So and there, there's just one more thing that I should add to that and it's, it's worthwhile to, to give this plug. So when we were working on this project, we worked with um, the, the user who maintains SuggestBot. And if you haven't used SuggestBot, it's available on many languages. I'm not quite sure the whole set. It's probably on your language. It's definitely on English. Um, anyway, and if you if you talk to user Netrom on English Wikipedia, he might you know get it set up on your language if it isn't already. Anyway, what SuggestBot does is it recommends articles for you to work on based on the articles that you've worked on recently, and it does this with a nice suite of algorithms based on links and co-edits and all this sort of stuff, and it works really really well. So you should check this out. It'll help you find stuff to work on that you probably didn't even know existed in in Wikipedia, and you're likely to want to edit it when you get there. So we were talking to him about the potential of including the draft namespace in this, uh, because right now it only includes articles that have cleanup templates on it. Um, and presumably, we can use the same sort of strategies to also identify drafts that you might like to be, uh, that you might be interested in collaborating with a newcomer or even an experienced editor on building. Um, so, uh, so the question was, is, have you done any, or have you or anyone else <coughs> reviews are simply clicking the various buttons which they have in their AFC review tool to say, basically, fuck off, you don't want any references. <laughs> uh, uh, versus whether they're actually making substantive changes to reformat the article, add references of their own. Basically, I'm trying to work out, is, is there any work being done to find out whether or not we have uh, useful edits to help newcomers or basically robots pushing buttons? So it, it, it's a mixture, but it seems to be dominated by uh, process. That, so when I, when I performed that analysis, I didn't go into these details, but I actually removed all the edits that were specifically just changing the AFC template and leaving a, a comment with like the decline or something like that. And that's the majority of, of contributions, contributions to these articles that happen through the AFC process. 
And so, I mean, that's another argument for why I'd argue that, that maybe the process is unnecessary. That if we could take the, the excellent editors that are working their volunteer time on AFC to try and improve this process, and instead have them spend their time contributing to these articles rather than going through this reviewing uh, process, this blocking reviewing process, then that would probably, it, it has the potential anyway to work better. That they can be one of those sets of many eyes that contribute where, where they can. Or maybe even facilitators that help go find editors that might be likely to be interested to work on these drafts. So yeah, to answer your question, we filtered those out when we did the collaboration measures, and there were there were a lot. That was mostly it, and we didn't see much collaboration because we filtered those out. So I I believe we're out of time. Oh, oh yes. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Hi. I hope you're enjoying the conference as much as I am. Yes. Uh, today I'd like to talk about uh, how we grow a culture of kindness um, on our sites. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, an idea, a hypothesis, uh, which is not necessarily proven, but which I thought might be worth exploring together. Uh, that we might be able to improve Wikipedia by being nicer to each other. Um, and I don't know if there's data to support it. I'm not a data guy like Aaron is. Um, but I think it's a premise worth exploring. Um, and um, I'll explain why in uh, the next few minutes. Um, I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, every year at Wikimania, I. Uh, ask people the burning question, how can we improve Wikipedia? And then they write down their idea on a pad and then I take their, po their photograph. And I get this photograph a lot. <laughs> Be nice, group hug from Joe Fred. And then yesterday I asked um, uh, Jimmy Wales and this was his answers, be kind to each other, even to the annoying ones. Um, and it's interesting because just a few hours ago, someone had asked me, well, I don't want to answer it, but I'd like to have your answer. And I had also come up with be kind as a possible way to improve Wikipedia. And again, every time I ask folks, I get similar answers. There seems to be something going on here that we here at Wikimedia seem to think that there might be some advantages or some benefits to being nice and being friendly to each other. It can't just be some kind of new age revival thing. It's, it just it, it occurs often that people suggest this as a possible solution. Um, why is that? Um, it seems that we face a certain challenge um, that may be due to some cultural issues. I don't know what the root causes are. I'm just noticing that sometimes there's a lack of civility on our pages. 
that sometimes people are hostile uh, to each other or to newcomers. And for a new user, it's particularly frustrating. And I've found myself at the other end of these kinds of conversations. And <clears throat> even though I've got a pretty thick skin, you still feel some trepidation when people insult you or demean you or make you feel bad uh, when you really didn't mean to do anything bad. Um, and it only happens a lot online. You know, there are a lot of trolls online. I think it's the nature of the software environments that we live in that because there's no you know, face-to-face -face contact. We have a tendency to demonize the other person. We, we, we can't tell who that person is, so we imagine the worst. And um, uh, somehow it just creates stress. And I think it's, it's hurting our movement, that these issues are prevalent enough. I'm hearing often that people experience these issues, and I think it's hurting our growth as a movement. Uh, again, I'd like to talk to Aaron and the researchers to find out whether everything I'm reporting here is in fact confirmed by the data. I don't know if it is. I'm just sharing my observations. Uh, huh. Yeah, I suspect that there is some data. I've seen some, but, but, but I'm not very good at this kind of analytics. I'm just more just uh, observing. Um, and um, so I took a vacation earlier this year and I went to Bali. And uh, I, I kept wondering you know, um, you know, how could we go about learning to be nicer to each other? And the contrast, as I was, you know, meeting these folks in this island, this is really a very interesting culture, the Balinese culture. Um, it seems like they spend a large amount of their time giving thanks to each other and to the universe. And um, there's an enormous amount of time do sharing gratitude in that particular culture. And it was very different than some of the things that I observed in some of these talk pages where people were being rude to each other. That this guy was like, so nice. He's my friend, you know, that we correspond all the time. He, he brought me into his house. He showed me his ancestors' temples. And he was just like so sweet. It was just all about being nice to each other. These ladies on the beach, in the middle of their ceremony, they're just welcoming me and they're saying, yeah, cool, please be part of it. And I say, what is it that these guys are doing that is just, you know, where they really invest serious time to sharing gratitude with each other that is different from what I'm observing in these talk pages? And is there anything that we could learn from those folks? Are any of the processes that perhaps um, could apply to us? I don't know, but it just, it kept striking me that perhaps that it should be possible to find a way to to be kind and, and helpful to each other even in an online environment where where it's difficult to know who the other person is so i'd like to propose just some ideas i don't know if they're right i don't know you know if, if they're wrong uh but just some thoughts that have come come up as possible ways that could improve the way we interact with each other and i'm just going to go through each of these you know points um, and then offer some suggestions that, that, uh, that might be helpful. And then I wanted to let you know that I've got a little etherpad in connection with this talk. Um, and you could go to that link. Uh, it's also on the submission page, you know, the, that's in the calendar on the Wikimedia site. And if you have some thoughts and some ideas, some comments, some links to studies, anything, I would love to start gathering research about this because I suspect that that particular direction may be helpful. Uh, you know, even if like half of these ideas there are no good, there's got to be a few good ones. You may have some ideas of your own. If we start gathering them together and applying them into practice, we might be able to improve the state of affairs. So the first uh, concept is to help newbies, uh, to, to welcome new users. Many of you suggest that all the time. Uh, this is probably one of the most frequent slides that I get, uh, you know, when I ask people for ideas. Um, showing them how to contribute. And you were talking about you know, mentors and, and how they can help, how collaboration can make a difference. Uh, give them safe spaces to learn. You know, a place where you know that people are not gonna go after you. Like the Tia House to me was just a really wonderful concept. Um, and it seems like maybe more spaces like that or more programs like that might be beneficial. And then there's also the concept of to-do to lists and micro tasks, giving people a few useful things to do. Um, so that's a whole area, it's just right when people are coming into our world, making them feel welcome and, and giving them, you know, a path to becoming uh, regular contributors. 
Um, the second area that seems promising to me is to train ourselves. Um, train ourselves first to be more civil, and maybe there's some kind of a civility toolkit that we could evolve, you know, just like rules of thumbs. We already have some great principles, like assume good faith. That's a fantastic principle. I, I you know, I, I love that we came up with it, but sometimes we don't apply it. And so how can, you know, is there like some kind of a little checkbox or, you know, a little reminder, you know, when things, we, 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 when things get stressful and it happens all the time, um, you know, sometimes we forget our principles. Uh, so maybe some kind of a way to, um, uh, to, to somehow just, when, when we fall off, you know, to, to, to come back into to, to the, the, the direction that we want to go to. Communications courses? Maybe server, all of us could learn how to communicate better with each other. Communication is hard. Um, it's not taught well at school. And uh, some of us, you know, a lot of the things I'm talking about are not really a, um, part of our educational system. You usually, you know, learn them from our parents. Um, I have to say that I'm only half the man that I would be if it wasn't for my wife. She has taught me so much that I didn't know. Uh, and I'm a lucky guy, you know. Um, I've, I've got that relationship, and then that my wife was able to help me. You know, sometimes it's your mother, sometimes it's your brother or sister. But sometimes we don't have such a member of our family, so we need to get that information elsewhere. Um, I also think that conflict resolution workshops could be really, really useful. Since we often get into these tense situations, we don't really know how to react. and. Conflict resolution is a tough thing to do, and there are facilitators that can help us do that. I took such a course uh, earlier this year, and I was just amazed about you know, all the things I didn't realize that there are actually ways to diffuse those tensions, uh, but we just need to be taught those things. And then, of course, mentoring programs. Uh, you know, mentoring programs for you know, newbies, of course, but also for uh, each other, like someone who's like really good at diffusing tensions might maybe mentor someone who's not so good one-on-one um, -on -one and just o over time help them uh, with that particular thing. Uh, the other thing is that it seems like it'd be great if we could reward kindness. So if we see someone who's just consistently being uh, nice and, and helpful, um, you, I'm not sure how we go about doing that, but just first tell them, you know, um, showing them the appreciation. You know, uh, sometimes it sounds corny. A lot of people say, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of like cheesy to say thank you to somebody or to, to say, hey, you did a nice job, you know, and then some, some, sometimes we're a little macho or uh, we just think it's just like phony or whatever. But, you know, the reality is everybody likes to get a little appreciation, uh, particularly when you're having a bad day or something like that. And so I would really encourage everybody, all of us, to go out of our way and when someone does well, say, hey, that was really good what you did. You know, even if it takes an extra minute to do it and you're busy, um, maybe have some kind of a celebration, you know, saying, okay, in the past month, the following people did really, really well, and uh, just a round of applause or something. And then most importantly, document their best practices, learn from them, um, those people who apparently do good. How do you go about doing this? What do you do, you know, when you're, you know, feeling like yelling at somebody and you, you how, what is the mental process by which you do not yell? Um, <laughs> Uh, social tools. Okay, so obviously software can help. Software is not the only solution, but there are a few things we can do. And I'd love for all of us to develop more convivial software. In, uh, I'm a product manager uh, at the foundation, and the product that I'm the proudest of during my three years at the foundation is I was the one who brought the thanks feature to Wikipedia. <laughs> with Ryan Caldari. Ryan Caldari was the engineer and the two of us just said, you know, we got to come up with some kind of a way to give positive feedback. We were working on the notifications project and we were noticing that, you know, it's like, okay, fine, our job is to get notifications when something important happens. And we're saying, well, wait a second, all the notifications we have so far are all negative. We've got undo, we've got revert, we've got, you know, uh, rollback, we've got it's like, is, isn't there anything positive? No, so let's see. No, no, there's, there's, not, there's nothing positive. Wikilove, well, nobody ever uses it. Um, so um, finally we said, well, you know what? We're not supposed to do this. We're supposed to do notifications. 
let's just do it. You know, how long is it going to take? A week or two? And we went ahead and did thanks with the support of a lot of people, Stephen Walling and Brandon and others who kept saying, hey, do you, do you think it'd be all right if we snuck it in? Said, yeah, go for it. Gratitude is cool. So we went ahead and we did it. Now it's there and people are using it. It's fantastic. So let's, let's, let's think of other ways to do it. Uh, there may be some other positive feedback tools that we haven't thought of. Um, civil discussion tools. Now, a lot of people are saying, oh, flow is this terrible thing. But truth be known, what flow is trying to do is it's trying to make it easier for people to communicate with, it, with each other. Uh, and yes, it's, an, it's different than talk pages, and you, many of us have become comfortable with the talk pages as they are. But many newbies, they see the talk pages. How does that work? You, know, like you, you can edit my comments. <laughs> and it's just so strange the way it's built. The, you know, in, in the rest of the world that we live in, um, it uses different kinds of tools. Um, and some of the tools are good, some of the tools are not so good, but we as a society need better civil discussion tools. I hope flow can be it, um, and I hope we can find even more ways to have intelligent discussions. And have a, by the way, flow is going to have a built-in thanks, in case you haven't noticed. So that's cool, because right now to do thanks, you have to go to the history page, which is a good roundabout way to say thank you to somebody. So having, having that built in is a really good idea. Uh, better use of user profiles. So when I go to a user profile, I can get a better idea of who the person is. I can get a sense of maybe uh, put a little avatar. Some of, some of us do that naturally. We, we put it in anywhere. And I know there's a resistance, you know, yeah, we're not supposed to be Facebook and all that. But you know what? You may hate Facebook, but they did a lot of things right. They have some of the best user interface design shops in the world. They just bought a slew of them, the best design shops they could get. There's a lot of good UI work being done at Facebook, whether or not you like it. And the use of avatar uh, in Facebook and other social media um, uh, networks is actually quite effective. Because when you see the person's face, you realize that that person is a human being just like you, not the demon that you imagine him or her to be. And, um, and, and, and so it humanizes the communication. Once you realize, oh, it's just another person like me, it's not some part of some weird species that's uh, out to get me, it changes your mindset. We're, we're, we're just kind of strange little creatures with our little minds. We, 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 we invent drama where there is none. We have these little stories running through our heads that make us think, you know, really crazy stuff. And so whenever we can give you visual cues or a little support to think of the other person as being um, as someone you want to interact with, it's helpful. Persistent identity. Um, that is absolutely key to any form of online collaboration. I've been in this space for, for a long time, working at Apple, working <coughs> Macromedia, Adobe, I worked with some of the very first graphical chat things. And without persistent identity, you get yourself into a world of trouble. And the reason is, is if, if I'm one person one day and then the next day I'm someone completely different, like I'm using a different IP address or whatever, there's no consistency. There's no way for you to say, oh, you are the person with whom I had that nice exchange yesterday. There's no, you, you're dealing with some ethereal entity and we human beings need to have some kind of grounding. We need to be able to know that the person I talked to yesterday, that is the same person I'm talking to, to, to today. It's really key. And so I really hope that we can um, all, uh, all it, as soon as possible, agree to support persistent identity, without which many of these social tools are not possible. And lastly, <clears throat> I realize it's hugely controversial, um, reputation. Um, Reputation is important. Uh, in real life, we have a way to find out whether someone um, over time has, be, has been trusted by others, whether, uh, you know, if, if 16 of my friends uh, tend to say this person is reliable, that's useful information for me to know. And I realize it's very dangerous, you know, it can be abused in so many ways. So you have to be very, very careful with how you implement reputation. But I hope we can get there, even though I, I understand all the objections against reputation, but there may be tasteful ways to do it. In the same way as we did thanks, you know, like before we did thanks, we considered plus one, we considered thumbs up, we considered all sorts of things that we knew would never fly at Wikipedia, but then we ended up on thanks, and that was okay. That was one that was actually possible 
to deploy on Wikipedia. I'm hopeful that we can do the same with reputation. Next, friendlier channels. <clears throat> um, this is back to um, the whole concept of uh, being able to recognize the other person as a human being. Uh, multimedia conversations are showing a lot of potential. Over the past year, I've done a whole series of video roundtables um, where we do it over Google Hangouts. We gather, you know, six to 12 to 18 people, you know, in that range, and we all have conversations. And we get to see each other, we get to hear each other's voices. Um, and all, you know, sometimes there's some technical issues, you know, people can't connect, but in general, I have found those to be vastly superior, superior to RC chats, which tend to be very chaotic. And IRC chats have their benefit when you're in a development environment, you need to interact very quickly with a programmer. Uh, and they're fantastic, I don't want to diss uh, IRC. Uh, it has its place. But whenever you add the extra bandwidth, where you can actually see the body language, hear the voice inflections, you usually can connect at a deeper level. And maybe again, it's because we're, uh, we're human beings, we're, you know, you know, half man, half beast, we still have these kind of ancient <coughs> ways of using our senses to correspond with each other. Uh, so I find these to be pretty helpful. The call-in talk show is also a really good concept. I was a radio producer for many years before becoming a television producer. Had absolutely wonderful epiphanies with uh, anonymous callers calling in. And again, the voice carries so much. As a television producer, I know that pretty much 80% of the emotional bandwidth is carried by the voice rather than by the visual. The visual helps you situate the person in space, but the voice carries all the emotion. Um, so it's, you know, e even if you can't do video, the, the audio portion is fantastic. Social media, again, some people frown on social media, but it's pretty damn useful. Um, and then meetups, of course, the more, I mean, for me, coming to Wikimania is always such an epiphany. I just love interacting with you guys. I come out of Wikimedia just like exhilarated because you know I, this is where I build the partnerships that throughout the rest of the year I'll be working on. Like in the multimedia space, I have dozens and dozens of partners from the community who are helping drive, th move things forward. And here at Wikimedia, we forge these relationships, we build them, we intensify them. Lastly, give everyone a voice. Now this is not, you know, we've all heard that before, but I'm just reiterating because it's so important and we're making such slow progress on that front. It's so sad. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the concept of reaching out to all stakeholders, we tend to huddle you know, amongst our editor community and that's fantastic because the editors are doing, every, you know, they're propelling this organization forward and this movement forward. But there's a whole bunch of other people that are part of our community. We always say the community and we tend to imply the editors. That's nonsense. The community is huge. It's a half billion people whom we serve. The readers are an enormous part of our community. And then we kind of shoo them off. We say, no, the readers are not important. They're stupid. You know, you do article feedback. Well, that was an interesting experience. Um, you know, the, the editors didn't want to touch the readers with a 10-foot pole. They're saying, I'm too busy. I'm exhausted. And I don't want to have to moderate their comments. Come on, guys. You're serving the public. This is what we're here for, is to educate the public. We have to interact with the public. And so yes, it's, it's some effort to moderate the comments. But you know, journalists uh, a decade ago were just like you. They were saying, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to go in and I don't, I don't want comments on my article because I'm too busy investigating a story and I can't do that. And then over time, journalist organizations learned that it was part of their duty as a journalist to interact with your readers. And that yes, it's uncomfortable and yes, 80% of the stuff is, is, is rubbish, uh, and that's just the nature of online comments. But we've got to find a way to reach out to our readers. We've got a way to make a connection with them. Their voice is not represented. It's like if, um, you know, in the United States, uh, with the 320 million people, um, you, you know, uh, only like uh, 1 million people uh, could vote or make decisions and then the other three, 299 million couldn't, ha didn't have a voice at all. That's exactly what we are now with our readers. They have no voice. The talk pages are not a convenient place for, readers are scared by the talk page, they're intimidating. They, first, they don't know how to use them, and if they could figure out how to use them, they're afraid they're gonna get yelled at, and they will get yelled at. So we gotta do something to do this. Make women feel at home. 
Come on, 13% or whatever the number is? How embarrassing is that? Why are we not welcoming women? Women who are, are the ones who, who know how to um, uh, uh, create social connections and, and, and they should be driving our community. I, I, it just fathoms me that we're not making more progress in making women feel comfortable. And so each of us really should just like at least once a month do something to, to, to help uh, bring women into our community. We need them badly. They could help civilize us, frankly. Um, and then welcome minorities. Of course, the Global South is not well represented. You know, it's, this is still, we're, we're much more elitist, elitist than we think we are. Uh, content experts, uh, you know, uh, journalists, like um, I worked in journalism before uh, for about seven years, and I asked my journalist friends, could you come into the Wikipedia movement? And they said, you must be out of your mind. You know, it's just, it's, just, it's not worth it. The, the investment of time and, and having to, to argue. And, con and many content experts tell me the same thing. They say, listen, I've written 16 books on this topic. I'm the content expert. But if I do an edit and then some kid reverts it like five minutes later. Um, and so we tend to reward tenacity over expertise. Um, we, we don't like experts. And so we say, well, because I don't like experts, I don't care that you've written the 16 books. I'm just going to get let the 16-year-old kid just keep reverting you, and then, then that, that's it. We need to do something about it. So I, I'm sorry. I'm sure this is all very controversial, and, 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 <laughs> and I'm probably offending some folks, and <clears throat> there's a lot of sacred cows involved, but somebody's got to say it. So and I'm the newcomer, so I get to say it. Um, so <clears throat> um, here's a really nice picture of Phoebe, you know, just giving us kind of a call to action to make it easy and joyful to find things to do. Uh, I think she's, she's spot on there. So my question to you, and I realize we're out of time, but uh, maybe if you could go into the etherpad or if we could talk, we talk in your community, ask the question, what are some of the tools and practices that we can develop to support a culture of kindness? And then, and then um, for all of us, you know, every day when we wake up, you know, if, uh, if I'm an editor and some new, new user just came in and did some stupid edits, be kind. Uh, if I'm the guy who was just reverted and I'm feeling really pissed off that my edit was reverted, be kind. Uh, if you're, a, if you're a, a user and a developer just you know, created a feature that you don't like and you hate it, be kind. Uh, if you're a developer and you're pissed off that you know, your new feature has not been adopted, be kind. All of us, you know, just use kindness as, 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 as a fundamental part of our way of interacting with each other. And my bet is that it will make things better. And then Aaron can tell us in a year or two whether in fact that's true. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's basically my encouragement to each and every one of us. And, uh, and I hope this, uh, this was helpful for you. And, and uh, thank you. Namaste. Two questions over there. an image that represents who you think you are. So uh, an avatar doesn't have to be your mugshot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it, but it, help, it still humanizes the communication, because now I recognize you as the friendly koala bear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yes? Good for you. Or was this a question? No, she was just a comment. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, you? I would like to make a statement about what you said. I've been eating for eight years and my wife for eight months. She does something. I do exactly the same. She gets stoned out and I get passed. Why? Because I'm senior. Right? Oh, because people know you and they don't want to mess yeah. with you. Or you just say you know what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not passing judgment, I'm just looking for some practical way to get, get along with each other. Well, first you be kind to them, that's a good starting point. You thank them when they do something nice, and over a period of time you civilize them. <laughs> yes? I've never heard the never never going to change is, doesn't play well in my book. You know, historically, or societies change all the time. Uh, sometimes you got to let go of sacred cow in the order, you know, in the interest of the common good. <clears throat> you know, another thing is if uh, we didn't have the IP thing, there'd be a lot less vandalism, there'd be a lot le less stress, and the stress is what's causing the weird behavior. So I think we should weigh the options. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so much better if you can thank them in person on their talk page, but thanks is just like a convenience for when you're really busy. It's better to thank somebody quickly than to not thank them at all. Uh, so I'm not advocating that we only use thanks. It's, that's kind of, over time, it's kind of lazy. There's nothing better than a personal thank, thank you note. But there are times when... All right. Um, I'm going to take these two last questions, then we got to really wrap up. You? I like that, the concept of honor. And again, it, it falls into this reputation discussion that we're talking about. Okay, last question and then we've got to wrap up because she's on the, she's been sending me little signals here. Uh, in red over there. the nature of the process uh, basically will never be, it's never going to be as fun as Facebook because, you know, yes, it is true that there's only one article, etc. Et but if we did a lot of the things that I just talked about so that people could feel safe, 
so that people could feel rewarded when they do well. It would maybe justify for your wife the um, you know, go, going the extra mile. And yeah, it's not as fun as Facebook, but it's purpose driven. The purpose of the encyclopedia is noble, inspiring, and motivating. But even though it has all those qualities, because it's such a scary place to work in, you, you just don't want you to get into the battle zone. If we could remove the battle zone aspects of it, then your wife will probably feel a lot safer going in, and she may be okay with the fact that it's gonna get edited, as long as it's edited kindly and with grace, and say, listen, I'm sorry, I have to take that sentence out, but here's why, and I really value what you do, and I hope that you try again. That section over there could use some help. Would you like to give it a shot? So as long as we learn to be more civil with each other, it's okay that it's the nature of the encyclopedia is hard. But if you add all these extra elements on top of it, then of course people will not come in. And I think we can do it. And I'm really encouraged by the positive uh, response for, from each of you. And I encourage us to continue this, maybe make this a little bit of a movement, the kindness movement on Wikipedia. And anyone, any of you who's interested in doing this, go ahead and sign it on the Ethopad and, uh, or email me. Uh, my email address is here. And um, let's, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. There's a group photo at Lakeside now if you want to make that your way down there. And the closing ceremony will be beginning at half past four. Uh, thanks to all our speakers, our tech support people, our social media people, and the Barbican. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Where's